Onomastics is the study of names, and the onomastic argument is one of the strongest arguments to be put forward in favour of the historicity of Jesus. It centres on comparing the statistical distribution of names that appear in the Gospels with what we know of the statistical distribution of names in the population of Judea around the time when the Gospels were written. Ancient historian Tal Ilan compiled a lexicon of names of people living in Judea between 330 BC and 200 AD from all available sources. These included the so-called desert papyri, the writings of historian Josephus, the New Testament, early rabbinic sources and ossuaries. These are carved stone boxes that were used to contain the bones of the dead, the ancient Judean equivalent of modern gravestones. From this, she was able to estimate the frequency with which individual names occurred in the population. Bible historian Richard Borkham took this and derived a frequency distribution of names to compare with the distribution of names occurring in the Gospel. The match was pretty good. Here is a histogram of the 15 most common names from non-biblical sources in blue. The Gospels, in orange, are a much smaller sample of writing with many fewer names occurring and therefore a lot more random scatter is to be expected, but nevertheless the match is remarkably good. We have much less information on the name distributions from other regions, but we do have limited data from Egypt from around the same time. There are 45 occurrences of the most popular seven names, the top two being Eliezer and Sabbateus. The Gospel frequency distribution does not fit this distribution nearly as well, but we must remember that in this case there will be much more random noise as both data sets are much smaller than Ireland's one from Judea. The distribution of names in ancient Judea was different from modern times in that common names were more common than they now are. For example, the most popular name given to baby boys in the United Kingdom over the past five years or so has been Oliver. Approximately 2% of boys have been named Oliver in that time. In ancient Judea, the commonest male name was Simon and accounted for 9% of men. The five most common male names accounted for 35% of men. These high name frequencies led to a problem for somebody writing a history, particularly as surnames were rarely used. It meant that you inevitably have a lot of people called Simon in any history. You therefore had to include qualifiers to allow the reader to distinguish between them. This is awkward but necessary for a historian. Fiction writers, on the other hand, generally get round this problem by selecting different names for their characters and consequently the distribution of names in fiction does not match the distribution in the population. We find such qualifiers in the Gospels, for example Simon the Disciple, Simon of Cyrene and Simon the Leper. So the onomastic argument goes that the distribution of names in the Gospels matches the distribution we know from the population in Judea at the same time. This is not what we'd expect from fiction, but it is what we would expect from history. Ergo, most of the names used in the Gospel refer to real people. This is the strongest part of the argument, and by the standards of the mythicism versus historicity debate, the statement has significant rigour. The argument then goes on. The Gospel distribution does not fit with that of the names from Egypt, and therefore it is likely that the history being related occurred in Judea. This is weaker on account of the small data set of Egyptian names available, but on balance it is reasonable. The argument is then developed further by Christian apologists with more subjective reasoning. It goes on, these historical events were recorded first in oral tradition and only later committed to writing. Common experience tells us that names are one of the most difficult things to remember concerning historical events. As in this case the names are correct, surely much of the history that surrounds them must also be correct. This bit of the argument is used to justify a triumphalist versus minimalist Jesus, and need not concern us further. The strong form of the argument is, however, of direct relevance to the question of historicity versus mythicism. If the names used in the Gospels suggest that they originated with real people, then the most obvious interpretation is that the Gospel stories themselves originated as stories about real people. If that is so, then why wouldn't it also apply to Jesus? If it does apply to Jesus, then it's only a small step to conclude that Jesus founded a religion, was the leader of that religion, came to be worshipped after his death, and the religion he founded eventually went on to form at least part of the Christian church. In other words, our criteria for Jesus being a historical figure would have been met. As this is the simple and most obvious interpretation of what we have observed about name distributions in the Gospels, I conclude that this onomastic argument does indeed favour historicity. I have yet to see the mythicists counter this argument, but there are possible objections. In order to counter it, 
the mythicists need to explain how the correct distribution of names got into the Gospels if they were fiction. One point is that the argument refers to the distribution of large numbers of names. It cannot be applied to individual names and therefore the argument in its strong form concludes that most of the characters in the Gospel originated as historical figures rather than all of them, leaving room for Jesus to have been inserted amongst characters who really existed. The mythicist point of view holds that the process of historicization of the Jesus myth started with Mark, or his sources, and the later Gospel developed the story from Mark, so I'll focus on Mark for the specific example. If Mark was deliberately trying to pass off myth as history, then it is reasonable to assume that he would have bolstered his claim by reference to known historical figures, and he may have given his characters names which sounded reasonable, but this does not explain the close match to the population distribution, nor his use of multiple people with the same name necessitating qualifiers. So it is hard to escape the conclusion that most of Mark's characters started out as real people, probably figures from the early church. Mark mentions 38 named people. Of these, eight are only mentioned once, with no actions being ascribed to them. Ten are mentioned as relatives of characters in the story, with no actions being ascribed to them either. A further four, John the Baptist, Herod, Herodias and Pilate, are historical figures, leaving 16 characters who take part in the action. Even the name distribution of these 16 is a fair fit. It is hard for mythicists to escape the conclusion that Mark was working from a list of names of real people, either written down or from oral tradition. The question then becomes, was this a list of persons associated with a historical Jesus, or was it simply a list of figures from the early church that Mark had particular reason to use, such as symbolism or perhaps political in an attempt to appeal to different sects or churches by including reference to key figures from their individual histories? While mythicists may do a better job of developing these arguments than I have, it would be difficult for them to look like anything other than attempts to counter the onomastic argument, an argument which seems most naturally to support historicity. So what we have with the onomastic argument is a similar situation to the argument from the silence of Paul. A primary argument is put forward by one side, in this case the onomastic argument in favour of historicity. The argument can be countered, but the net result is that the primary argument prevails, but more marginally. In the next video, I will turn to the question of the extra-biblical historical record, an area of debate that is particularly frustrated by the flawed authority and straw man arguments.